tuning for The Joan Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview with the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Waiting to be profiled today are Daisy Torme and author Ellen Sandler. Daisy Torme was born in Los Angeles to legendary jazz musician Mel Torme and British actress Jeanette Scott. A few years after appearing at the age of eight on a TV special with her father called The Christmas Songs, her parents split and Daisy moved with her mom to London. She went to boarding school. She was in residency at the English National Opera. She won honors at the Royal Academy of Dramatic Arts but she came back to Los Angeles to earn her Bachelor of Arts in English. She went to UCLA. How important were those studies at the English National Opera with, uh, who was it? Dennis, Dennis Wicks. Dennis Wicks. Well, Dennis was incredible. I was in boarding school, as you said, and he came down twice a week, and we were very lucky that he was sort of the resident where we were. And I started oh. singing with him, and before I knew it, I started doing operas with like local regional companies and stuff like that and it was, you know, when you've never done opera before and you don't really know opera very well, I think you look at it as being a very stuffy medium, uh, a lot like fine art, you know, and it's exactly the opposite. If you like to sing and if you like to act and you want to be around a lot of other people that are just as big of a ham and love also <laughs> to sing and to act, but are pretty serious about their classical music studies, then you're just in a perfect environment. But, it was great fun and um, amazing tutelage. But how did you know that you could sing opera? <laughs> had you been taking singing lessons? Well, I started taking singing lessons when I was about 13, 12 or 13. I'd always sung. So when you but were I started on the taking show? actual lessons, you know. So when you were on the show with your father at eight, were you singing? Oh, in the house, in the car, <laughs> in the bath. Always? <laughs> yes, always, always, in the school choirs and stuff like that. But oh, it was I only see. when I became sort of a, a young teenager that I started <laughs> really learning much tougher pieces from the magic flute and from Fidelio and, and really kind of more serious classical operatic stuff. So you were living in London at the time. In the countryside, in England, actually. In the yeah. countryside. Mm -hmm. Your uh, grandmother was a great actress, yes. Dame Thora Hurd. Incredible actress. Did she help you with your acting? Yeah, I think probably, you know, we've grown up in such a family of performers. I mean, everyone's a performer. But when it comes to my grandmother and what I specifically remember about what she taught me, I, mean, I don't think, well, my father, I was going to say, I don't think I've ever seen somebody such a pro, but my dad was also such a pro. And like, I remember my grandmother telling me things that don't really have to do with acting. Like she said to me, if you're five minutes late and you've kept 10 people waiting, you've wasted 50 minutes. Isn't that interesting? And I, you know, I am now a compulsively early person. Um, but that's a so, follow through. That's teaching yeah. you something that you have to use in yeah. this profession of yours. Yeah. If you're on the air, you were a, a radio announcer, yes. you had a show. Yep. You couldn't be late for that, could no you? No way. <laughs> and, and I do a lot of live television and stuff like that, and you cannot walk in. As you well know, halfway through a live broadcast, no way. And, and I, I'm glad she taught me that. And other, other weird little kind of superstitions, like always sign a contract on a Friday. I mean, oh, weird things, things like that. that. that, but that are fun. that she had learned in England? Yeah. That she had learned as she was acting? Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. Why did you leave London then, or the countryside, or boarding school, or the English National Opera, sure. RADA? Why'd you uh, come back to UCLA? That's a great question. Um, <laughs> and I hope to give you a great answer, Joni. Uh, you know, when we moved to England, I was 11, and I had gone to an all-girls boarding school that whole time, all the way through graduating high school. 
I never went to football games. I never had a homecoming. I never had a prom. I never went on dates. I was at an all-girls school. I, I desperately wanted this very American experience that, were you, were I, you, that I knew I didn't have. But were you visiting your father so you yes. saw what was going on in yes. America? Yes, and remember, <laughs> I, I'd gone to school here up until the end of sixth grade, right. so I watched all of my friends go on and do these things, and I really, I was the girl in high school who never had time because I was always rehearsing for something. <laughs> so I wanted to go to dances and basketball games and all of that very American stuff. But you turned into a sports junkie at I, UCLA. Because of UCLA. <laughs> Why? How did that happen? Well, I was a little bit of a sports junkie before that, to be honest. You know, my dad was a big sports fan, my brothers, my um, mom even, you know, oh, Wimbledon, everything stops oh. for Wimbledon in our house. Oh. And, uh, and on my dad's side, I mean, the Indy 500, we all get together like it's Thanksgiving. I mean, it's a big family a event. Actually, so. that's where my father, who had winning cars at the Indianapolis Speedway, knew your father. Is that right? Yes, so well, that's how that connection I came. was lucky enough to, ah, uh, oh, that guy right there. This, this is your dad, it and is this is you at a, where at a basketball game. That's at Poly Pavilion <laughs> at UCLA, and my dad was so great about coming coming to little events like that with me. Um, but he actually uh, made some phone calls and pulled a few strings, and I was able to go to the Indy 500 one year and <laughs> go down into the pits and see the cars. I mean, this is the kooky, weird girl that I am. I'd rather go to a, a Laker game than a, a, a fine restaurant half the time. That's really funny, because then you started following. Did you think you were going to announce be an announcer for sports? Did you ever think about that? You know, I did. I considered doing the whole sports broadcasting thing. I've worked in sports. I worked for a company called Broadband Sports for, for a few years. And we, oh. and we had the, all the interaction with all of the athletes. And oh. I mean, really, it was one of those jobs that when you're an actor, you have a part-time job. And um, but you were really serious. You yeah. were serious about the sports thing. I mean, oh, you could yeah. have made that a career. Oh yeah, like you know, don't don't bring up you know tape delay of sports with me, or we'll be here for an hour of me ranting and raving. I can't stand it. You, you know, started doing peeve. a lot of voiceovers. Yes. And how did that come voiceover. about? You did animation, commercials. How do you get voiceover? You know what, Joan? I just think everyone in my family, from my father to James, my brother, who's a singer, we're, we're, we all just have a love affair with the microphone, is <laughs> the way that I put it. I don't see any other way that this could have happened. Uh, because, as you said, I mean, I've done pretty much anything you can do on a microphone, <clears throat> including some things, you know, that uh, make me blush when I think about it. Well, but, you know, I've done sounds for all kinds of things. You go to the market and you hear someone talking about the daily yeah. specials, and that was your voice. That was me. When I was a senior in college, I would do the... Uh, having a picnic this weekend? How about some lemonade to go with your feast? And I would do all of that you stuff. You never think of that the, that's a real person over there doing it because you just hear it when you're walking down the aisles, and, right? And the truth is that I was just imitating all of the people that I had heard and then that's how I literally, luckily, thankfully, fell into this kooky world of, of voiceover work. So as a, as a female and with the voiceovers and with a great voice, we never hear women announcers. We well, hear this very is true. few, you know, like in between TV shows, advertising. That's absolutely true. I've done I've done a little bit of that promo work, and uh, it is a very male dominated field. I don't know why, especially during the daytime. I, to me, it should be a woman's voice. And, and in fact, when I first uh, got my radio job, they were not looking for a young woman. They were looking for an older guy. And, uh, and boy, were they surprised when they got me, something a little different. When you, when you do the voiceovers, you have to use different styles. You have oh, a British yeah. accent, right? Yes, I go up for all the British stuff. I did the big British news report in Syriana, which is great oh. because now you can Google me and George Clooney and 10,000 things come up, so I'm so, very happy So the about thing that. is, when, when you do that, when you were on Syriana, did they see your face? Just heard your voice? It's all vocal. And you did, um, what else, Bobby? Yep. You did some other films? You've heard my voice in all kinds of stuff from Austin Powers to ER and Desperate Housewives. It's, and it's, it's a really fun, fun world. And frankly, if you're the class clown and you're the person that can imitate <laughs> all the teachers, this might be a really 
a wonderful avenue for you because that's really all I do all day. You mentioned your brother James. Yeah. And the two of you are doing, you, you do a lot of performing together. You yes. You also do a lot of charity work. Yes. And you're doing a, a concert in Thousand Oaks yes. at the Civic Center. Mm -hmm. And it's about... Mel Torme's California Suite. That is a big part of this show, absolutely. This is such what a is special this? thing. You know, we're a very family oriented family. You know, even though we're very kind of Hollywood in, in its heyday, we're a very family oriented family. And with Father's Day, you know, kind of just passing and whatever, it, they're doing this incredible show kicking off in Thousand Oaks. And what makes the California oh, kicking speech? Kicking off, we can see it every day. Kicking it off might be in going Thousand all Oaks. Over. Absolutely. Oh, and right. what's really amazing and important about this is, first of all, the California Suite was a really big piece of music, but it was a jazz piece, almost done oh. in that classical style that a big suite would be done in. So that's really kind of important but what's really cool and I think very heartwarming about this is that the great Marty Page of the Marty Page Deck Tet was the original arranger on that California suite and now it's the 50 year anniversary of the California suite being recorded and now James is singing it your brother, and James. And guess who's conducting it? Marty Page's son, David. So you all went into music. We all went into it, and David himself is uh, just so overly accomplished Grammy, Emmy winner, the whole thing. And it's, so it's just these two families coming together again to celebrate California and jazz and music and standards. And, and that's the other half of the concert is just these wonderful standards that, did you, did that you my know dad each made other? famous. Did you know each other as children? Uh, not so much. I mean, the families have known each other. Right forever but there is definitely and I'm sure you know this Joan having been in and around the business for so long there's a real kinship between the children of people That's and I, I remember meeting Peggy Lee's daughter never met her before but it was like seeing my cousin do you yeah, know what I mean right. I went to school with her oh did yeah, you Barbara, right? Fantastic. Was Bar Barbara was her father I was lucky enough to interview her and indeed her daughter when I was oh. doing some KCET work with with Peggy Lee oh, so that's great yeah so, so we all feel like cousins and, and that's really so neat. part of this California suite this is another Mm -hmm. That's um, the original that, This is the original one that And then here's the Marty did. Page right here. And then, oh, and the, these were the two. Yeah. But, um, it's an amazing, wonderful piece of music. The New West Symphony. That's right. It's a this quintet. Is, what is it, a quintet? No, the New West Symphony is a, is a full orchestra oh, that's going orchestra. to be doing the Thousand Oaks concert. And then within the California suite, there's a vocal group. So oh. for those people that might remember my dad's Meltone group, Mel Torme and the Meltones, yes. you're going to get those sort of five-part harmonies and four-part harmonies in there a little bit too, which give it that, you know, that real swing feeling. And you're singing. You Are never you know. In you never oh. know when I might get up there and sing a few notes. You just never know. Oh, but you were a soprano, right? I've so been a little bit of everything oh, you again, <laughs> again. You know, depends on how much drinking I did the night before. Do you miss <laughs> London at all? Uh, I miss London, but I make a point of getting back there. Is your mother still there? Yep, my mother's still there. She lives in the countryside down in West Sussex, and uh, oh. I do go back for long chunks and, and not only spend time with her and, and family there, but all my high school friends. You know, you go to boarding oh, school, I know. and trust me, these are close friends. I know. <laughs> um, as a performer and yeah. singing and voiceover and acting and everything that you do, what's your favorite? Uh, medium spotlight. <laughs> I mean, being in the spotlight is that right? Well, I, it, only because that's an impossible question for me to answer. I love that. I mean, there, there is a very serious acting side of me that <laughs> loves the Shakespeare and and really the more serious stuff. And then uh, there's the sort of more vaudevillian side. And this is how we all are in our family. I mean, you know, Christmas time is is a always a struggle of no me and in the <laughs> in best the way in the best way what about with your brother do you sing t the two of you together oh yeah i mean we're we're constantly Are you, like pushing each other out of the <laughs> We're doing bits all the time. We're incredibly close. James and I are really close, and we had the, the England experience together, yeah. and we went back and forth as really little kids three times a year, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and that's a lot of international travel with your siblings. So yeah. as a result, we have, so, I mean, everything's an inside joke or a look, or we just know how to read each other that way really well. But it's well. so great because your father was married a lot of times yeah. and did have a different families, right? Yeah. So it's nice to... to hear you talk about your father being so 
identified with you and your oh, brother. And, and but we're all, I'm, my, all of my siblings, no matter who our mother is. Is that uh, right? All of our, yeah, we're all really close and, and we love each other a lot. Oh, and, that's so uh, great. And we communicate with each other all the time. And, you know, like I said, my brothers are sports freaks like I am. So I always know that after a big UCLA win, I have a bunch of people I can call that, that will know just where my enthusiasm well, is coming from. We have to say SC before we leave. But anyway, thank you. I beg your pardon, Joan. Go Bruins. <laughs> Thanks a lot for being Thank with us. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure. And don't go away. We'll be right back with author Alan Sandler. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and you're watching the Joan Quinn Profiles. Born and raised in Sioux City, Iowa, with a Bachelor of Science from Syracuse and a Master of Fine Arts from uh, the American Institute Film. of Film, American <laughs> Film Institute, AFI, author Alan Sandler has worked uh, as a writer, producer for more than 25 network TV comedies, including ABC's long-running series, Coach. Ellen was nominated for an Emmy uh, for the CBS hit, Everybody Loves Raymond, and I have a picture of her on that set. Her book, The TV Writer's Workbook, tells it all. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. Do you um, teach all the things in your book? at SC because you are on the staff at SC, right? I am joining the staff Oh, this joining fall. the staff. Yes, yeah. it's my first uh, ah. foray into academia. Oh, I, mean, good. I have taught for a number of years. I've taught I have adults, but uh -huh. this is the first time I'm actually teaching students who are getting uh, a degree. So you're going to be in the <laughs> cinema and a cinema I have to give them school, a grade. Right? <laughs> you have to give them a grade. Yes, I've never had to give a grade before. Uh, but will you be teaching screenwriters what to do? I'll be teaching writers how to do what I know how to do. Uh, Any kind of writers? What do we call them? Anybody? Screenwriters? What's different from a screenwriter, a writer? TV. Script? Well, TV writers. I, my career has been in television. Uh -huh. I... Uh, I think it's the sa you follow the same dream, you follow the same impulse, and every script that you write has to have some basic structural elements that are the same whether you're writing a play, which is where I started, or a screenplay or a television show. But each one has its own special, unique demands, and so you adapt. But you're talking, you're saying that you're going to be on the faculty at, at USC. But in the meantime, you've been doing conferences yes. where you have been teaching the same thing. Is yeah. that where you talk about the adults, yeah. more or less? Those are, those are people who are already uh, started their careers or just beginning to start their careers, but they are out of school. They're not students. So one of the things in the book, this book, the oh, TV Thank you for writers, holding that up. <laughs> <laughs> the TV Writer's Workbook, which is really complex and easy to follow. Oh, good. I mean, it's it, compact, I should say. Compact rather than complex, but easy to follow. Good. I'm um, glad it's easy to follow. There, I, I hope for that. There uh, are so many things in here. One of the things, uh, and you worked as a script doctor. Yeah. What's that? What is a script doctor? <laughs> well, I take the temperature of the room. And yeah, really. I, a script doctor is essentially a coach, the way oh, I do it. Um, um, I work with people who come to me for help with their material. I like to get in on the ground floor. I, I think that you get the most bang for your buck if you come to me really early in your process. Oh, anyone can come to you and you help them with it? The, oh, I see. Yeah. Well, they have to pay me. But yeah. <laughs> no, but I mean, it, it's that kind of thing. Yeah. It's like they just hire going. Me. Oh, I see. I didn't realize that. Yeah. I thought studios. I would send my script to the studio and they didn't like it, so they'd call you in to change it. That's not it? Uh, well, that, no, that would be a second writer. I could be, I could be hired as a writer to, oh, on, by yeah, a producer I to see. rewrite a script. That would be somewhat different. Or they might bring me in, a producer might bring me in to 
talk about how we can improve the script. That that is a possibility, and I have done that. Oh. But primarily, people writers come to me with their work, and I help them develop their idea and create the structure for their story. So it's uh, it's like a tutor in a way. I call it a coach, maybe a because coach? I have a. A jacket from Coach, which says Coach on the oh, back coach, of it. Oh, Coach, that's right, because you write, wrote for <laughs> coach, wrote for coach for so many years. Well, I wrote for two years. Two years, I two think. years yeah. and that, the last those two years. were the, the good Emmy years, nominated. The good years. Right. Bought my house. With but what my about coach career coach? You do help yeah. um, career coaching. Is that just for writers? No, what? I work with actors. I, w I work with actors on audition process. Uh -huh. I work with writers uh, primarily because that's what I'm known for. That's my expertise. And I do work with writers on career strategies, what to do with your script once you have it. Uh, do you have a class for that? Or is it that's individual? That's private. That's individual. Oh, private. I do teach private classes in pilot writing. I teach a class, and I'm one of the few teachers who does teach how to write a pilot. And what's a pilot? A pilot is an original <laughs> yes. script for an original show for television. Oh, There's a I difference see. between a spec script, which is the standard entry document that you must have as a writer if you want to be considered. You need to be able to show people a spec script that you wrote. You have to prove that you can write. I mean, any can be anything. They Gen don't have to like it. It just shows you know the form. Well, yeah, they have to like it. They have to like <laughs> it. They, oh, they have to like it. Oh, yes. They have to laugh and but, they have to like it. But does it have, is it because of the form that yeah. it's in? And yeah, they you, show, you shows write that a, you can do that? You write an episode of, of an on-air show. Uh -huh. I compare it to... Um, Schools of Art, I don't know if you, the Academy of Arts, right. they used to send, they send artists to museums to copy, line right. for line, great paintings, right. not because they're learning to be forgers, but to learn how to structure a painting, how to do it. And it's the same thing with writing spec script. Your book tells you how to do that. Step by step. Step by step. That's, I had to teach myself. So that's, that's why I thought that maybe that was the idea that you have to know what comes first and how to do it and, and all the, the intricacies do. of putting it on the paper. Oh yeah, you do. But you one absolutely thing, do. One thing um, about your your coaching yeah. career or your career coaching is that the people who have come to you have entree to other staffs and TV and, and recommendations from you because you know other people. Yes, uh, that is a possibility, but I don't advertise that as a, as an element. But I really it seems can't like promise that would that. be no. But it seems like that would open doors. Um, you know what opens doors? <laughs> I'm going to tell you the truth. Yeah, I know it. Yeah, you have to know people. You have to have recendations. But the only thing that really opens doors is a great script. It's got to be on the page. But do those people know that? Do they know a great script from well, a bad script? Yeah. Well, they yeah oh yeah, you a direct who 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 approves well, it the director the producer you you if you are looking for television work, mm -hmm. television is looking for a writer mm -hmm. more than looking for a script per se. So they're going to read oh, your script uh -huh. to see how you tell a story, how you write dialogue, are you funny on the page? Do you want to turn this page? And the people who read it can tell. If they're turning the pages, they know this oh, is working. And then they're interested in you as a writer. They may never buy that spec script. That's not what you're looking for. You're looking to be hired on the basis of the quality of your writing to come on, pitch new stories for their, uh, their shows, okay. the shows that are on. You just said something, pitch. That's one of the questions that's also in here. How to pitch. What do you Chapters pitch? Chapters on pitching. What, do you, what is a pitch? Oh, a pitch is, <laughs> is probably the most painful thing a writer ever has to do. I can imagine. You know, I, I became a writer so I wouldn't have to talk to people. <laughs> and that's why everyone becomes a writer. So they can be in their own little yeah. things. And then you find that. out, yeah. no, you, want, uh, you, have to, you have to constantly talk to people. You have to pitch your ideas. And you have to be able to pitch the concept in one sentence. How do you do that? You work really hard at it. First of all, you have to know it uh -huh. yourself. Your you have to identify what your story is really about, and I say it has to be about something, not just the plot. The plot is not what it's about. The plot is important, but what it's about is the turning point for the character. Oh. And also, <laughs> your connection to it, you as the writer. That combination 
is what it's really about. And then what happens is also important, but you have to be able to tell me what happens in one sentence or I can't get the whole thing so from listening to a pitch. how do you, you have to have a great idea. Can't teach somebody to have an idea, can you? Well, I try to in the book. Do I you? Think. That's part of what was in the book. So yeah. how do you teach somebody to get an idea? Well, I have a, a, a procedure, <laughs> a several procedures that I personally have used. How I discover ideas is I go through the seven deadly sins. I go to the most humiliating, the most painful, the most exasperating, the most upsetting things in my life, and that's comedy gold. Oh, comedy, but you're talking about comedy, right? Any so, idea. So, uh, but any idea. Any idea. I happen to tell things through a comedic point uh -huh. of view. But it's the same for drama. Uh -huh. And if, if you go to those places in your life and, and you can tap into that, and I have exercises in the book as to how specifically I do this. I really have broken it down. How to get an idea. I yeah. mean, I was thinking, who could teach you to get an idea? I can. But, but you do, because <laughs> do. you do have certain places to go and look for those ideas. Yeah. And then there's procedures to take that idea and translate that into a story. Because there is a difference between an idea and a story. What about an outline? What is the other thing they say? Give me a treatment. A treatment. What's a treatment? Well, you know, some people use that word interchangeably with outline. Uh. Or uh, I use the word treatment to mean the narrative story. Mm -hmm. So it's a short? It's about two pages for oh, a half-hour episode. Yeah. Oh, it is. In fact, on Everybody Loves Raymond, we used to call it a two-pager. Because oh, this, oh, yeah. this is you Ray. with, with Ray, Ray on the With set. my script for No Fat, which was the tofu turkey episode. Oh, yeah, that was the great. Second year of so Thanksgiving. Do, so do you eat tofu? I personally eat tofu. I made it last night. As so, a matter of fact, not turkey, though. Not totally. But so turkey. that was something that you called from your own Absolutely. Thing. That came from, from my life. Absolutely. And I wanted Marie to be on a diet and cooking a new way, a new healthy way, because I put my family through that. And I, that was what I pitched to Ray, I, to Phil. My, and so my they laughed. And they laugh, and yeah. it was funny. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so you we have to go. But a treatment is... A, a treatment. treatment is the narrative <laughs> storyline of the episode or the movie. Movie, it'll be longer than two pages, but it's not broken down into scenes. I see. I call that an outline. Now, some people reverse it and I call see. it different things. But that's the but idea. But I call a treatment. So we had an outline today. We went through it really fast. And I thank you, Ellen. We're done. We're done. <laughs> okay, thanks very thanks. much. And thanks for watching Ellen Sandler and her book. And keep riding to 777 South Figueroa, 44th floor, Los Angeles, 90017. See you next time.